good sound? Well, we're going to get started. Welcome. Can you hear me? All right, this is a wonderful sound system. You can hear me, but I can't tell that you can hear me because it's so beautifully distributed. Well, welcome everyone to Hudson Institute. I'm Charles Davidson, the executive director. There we go. I'll start again. All right, welcome to Hudson Institute, everyone. I'm Charles Davidson, the executive director of the Kleptocracy Initiative here. And we are extremely honored to be hosting Judge Jose Grinda Gonzalez, who has come specially from Spain to visit us uh, for a couple of days with uh, this event here and uh, various other things going on in town. Um, he's uh, really an example of what can be done, and I don't want to say uh, more about him by way of introduction, because he's going to speak about what he has done and what is going on in Spain in terms of the work that they are doing. So I don't want to color that in any way, shape, or form. Um, I would like, of course, to say just a very brief word about the Kleptocracy Initiative and how this fits into where we are now, because it's been, uh, well, it's almost exactly four years since we started this effort here. And um, initially, the, the issue was um, helping to make people more aware of the problem. The kleptocratic threat and the export of corruption and kleptocracy into the West was something that was sort of over there. It was a, uh, it was a uh, problem that wasn't generally recognized in the DC policy community. That has changed. And so then our emphasis became, well, what can we do about this policy-wise? And as many of you know, there's a lot going on in that vein. But all policy, all laws, will need law enforcement, both domestically and internationally. And the threat of transnational criminal organizations and the way they enmesh themselves with governance, governments of various sorts and with non-state actors is a national security threat to us, but it's a civilizational security threat to democratic and free countries in general. So we clearly need muscular, fearless, non-corrupt law enforcement. Judge Grinda, please. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Charles, of course, and the Hudson Institute for this invitation. I consider it to be an honor. First of all, it's wonderful to be here in Washington and uh, at this institute. Desde que a Washington y Since desde que I arrived here, and, and, uh, well, we've been cooperating with pues, U.S. institutions for quite a while, the FBI, which is here in D.C. Y gran parte de, de mi exposición and y gran parte de, a large part of my presentation <coughs> and what es, I want to speak eh, about today a una actuación has to do mm, actuación criminal, es decir, with actuación De, de funcionarios públicos españoles uh, and que han ido investigando esto que decía Charles uh, la cleptocracia pero desde abajo tanto eh, policía nacional at the grassroots, uh, in other words the civil guard and the national police han since la preocupación the 90s Y han tenido, These officers eh, and agents have been concerned and uh, were smart enough to realize problema, eh, 
derivado de esos especies de años salvajes que se, que se dicen en Rusia, que son los años 90, from the savage years in Russia, años en los called, que el pueblo ruso, los ciudadanos rusos, ven con optimismo la salida de un régimen tan opresivo como el régimen soviético, uh, they... y de esa felicidad eh, rusa o de las personas que estaban incluidas en la Unión Soviética from... entonces, de esa felicidad pasan a una auténtica desasiego, una auténtica pobreza. Real poverty. El pueblo ruso tiene una, the Russian una people riqueza intelectual eh, asombrosa, incredible asombrosa por, por rara, intellectual por richness. We see this at every es, level, eh, and we see this digno de, de admiración uh, through ese, objective data. And, of course, we should de admire that. Uh, but then there's a series of people who are brazen bueno, no es and have no shame. Eh, o, um, o algo de alguien, pero uh, this no is certainly insulto, not como, a compliment, insulto, uh, compliment uh, uh, although I don't think it's exactly a, an a insult decir, either, bueno, um, um, because bueno. I'd like to avoid insults Son when unas, I speak. Del político, These del are a series of people who are involved in the political world, um, in the criminal world, and they are seizing all kinds of assets in their country, and this means that they are garnering power, economically speaking, and they are taking on power um, in an exaggerated manner. And that finally leads to a an incredible problem in Russia, but that problem is then transferred elsewhere. And the leader that we see at the head of this problem is none other than organized crime. In Spain, lo que vemos es, well, bueno, nosotros no, yo no not, tenía ni not idea. Us, eh, well, I had no idea. Guardia Civil y Policía, I always no, talk about the National Police and the Civil Guard. A finales de los 90, at the end of the 90s, they are the ones, together with the National Intelligence Agency, begin to be concerned, which goes beyond just the criminal sphere. What they saw was that a great deal of money was coming in, capital flows, and that we needed to have some filter, some control over that. And that's the complicated part, because it's as if we were trying to take preventive measures before we get hurt, we are going to put a bandage on it. But it was the only way that uh, turned out to be effective. There are other European countries that uh, are wonderful countries, uh, maybe better than Spain in many ways, but I have to say our police were really ahead of the curve in this regard. Now, if we look at an analysis of kleptocracy, those who have political and economic power in any country, not just Russia, it's complicated to investigate those persons, and I'm talking about criminal investigations. It was also complicated to kick off investigations uh, on people who are high-level criminals because it's known that in a pyramid criminal organization at the bottom we have those people who are directly related to ordinary crimes like killing, extortions, uh, drug trafficking, and then at the top they are our leaders that have little contact, directly speaking, uh, with these quote-unquote ordinary crimes. Usually, criminal investigations begin at the bottom. And Spanish police, however, began at the top with those kingpins, and some of them have been convicted in Spain, like uh, Zilov, Kalashov, and other mafia 
bosses. O probablemente podamos hablar de ellos. Um, I'm sure that we can speak about them later. Y esa investigación a partir de mi trabajo, ni totalmente de arriba, ha tenido unos frutos y es que at the bottom, at the hemos top, detectado has que born fruit. We detected that recognized criminalized or criminal organizations recognized as such by the Russian prosecutor's office when they get in contact with us, we collaborate with them and uh, it surprises many people that uh, we actually collaborate with Russian prosecutors um, because many people think that they're going to be protected by them. Uh, by the Russian prosecutors. Uh, one way to eradicate corruption, and we know a bit about it in Spain, is that uh, investigations, uh, well, people think uh, that if they reach the prosecutor's office, uh, then really it won't be a thorough investigation. Uh, but really what we want is to eliminate criminal organizations. And uh, we have seen that in Spain, though people are demanding that the prosecutor's office take on these investigations and not just the police. So it's important to talk about our experience and offer it to others. And I come on behalf of the anti-corruption office of the prosecutor and on behalf of the state of Spain. Um, again, I appreciate this invitation from an NGO um, and it's true I'm not formally representing the prosecutor's office, or rather I've come here in my own capacity, but I do feel proud to represent both Spain and the prosecutor's office. So I'm going to take a few minutes now to talk about the anti-corruption prosecutor's office. That's the institution I work for. And what is its relationship with organized crime? It is called the Office of, of the Prosecutor Against Corruption and Organized Crime. It's not new. It was new in Spain. But, uh, well, we have the Palermo Convention from 2000 about transnational organized crime that led to the Merida Convention under the UN. And in the preamble of both conventions, uh, talk about the corruption and organized crime and its links. So this is nothing new. And it's nothing really ahead of the curve to say that the relationship between corruption and organized crime is constant, ongoing. And and we need to attack it in a coordinated manner. And that's why we have these two international instruments of the UN, and that is why uh, as Charles said, it's surprising that until recently we haven't realized or some countries haven't realized uh, that this relationship is very close. In other words, corruption and organized crime, well, is not a lower level corruption, rather a transnational organized crime that's evolved in corruption means that this is high level corruption. The strong criminal organizations are not uh, happy or content just to uh, corrupt a low-level mayor, they go to the highest levels to the extent that it seems that this corruption is not corruption. Rather, it's the power is like that. Que el poder expresa a los ciudadanos que esto es so normal. No es it's almost as if they wanted the powerful to tell society this is what power is. Power is corruption. And so uh, they're trying to convince citizens of this. Our anti-corruption prosecutor's office was founded in 1995 in a period when in Spain we realized, well, we had gone from a dictatorship to democracy, but that doesn't mean that we're going to have better leaders. And there was a moment where citizens felt desperate because they realized that 
new politicians are also corrupt. But the big difference is that in the dictatorship in Spain from 36, 1936 to 1976, well, there was no fight against corruption. Um, uh, society thought it was just normal. That was just the status quo. And so the powers of my office are national powers. There are several prosecutors. There are 28 in Madrid. And then we have several prosecutors who are all over the country. And so this is the normal result of the decentralization process that has gone on since the founding of our new constitution, which is based on a decentralized government. Our powers uh, are very powerful to fight co corruption, and there's one in particular that allows us uh, to fight against organized crime. Uh, we are allowed to investigate money laundering committed by organized crime or organized crime groups. There's just one exception. Those criminal organizations that are devoted to drug trafficking, that actually falls under another prosecutor's office, which is the anti-narcotics prosecutor's office. And so the specialization has allowed us to be very effective and allow me, if I may, uh, to predicate here. Um, and yes, this office pays me and I am allowed to be here, but it, it, I want to talk about the complex structure, and it is the structure of the state. First of all, we have a judicial office. In other words, the individuals who form the core of the office, and then we have three support units, as we call them. We have National Police and Civil Guard in one unit, and they only work with our office. Um, so they are under us. They're our subordinates. Then we have another unit, which is from the tax ministry, and they look at databases and all the tax information of people who reside in Spain or come to Spain and uh, settle there. We have all all the information about uh, these people's assets. And thirdly, we have another support unit, which is the General Intervention Unit. They are uh, public servants who actually control what the state spends. In other words, how uh, contracts are awarded, how funds are allocated under these contracts. In other words, uh, the interaction with the private sector, and in our office, uh, well, that's the structure. This setup uh, is multidisciplinary. It's quite complex. And so it's complex because we're fighting organized crime, which is also complex. And so um, I, I would wanted to just make a few drawings here if you don't mind. Since I'm not an artist, I ask you to for forgive me. Um, they're just rectangles. Well, uh, human imperfection. Yo digo que hay un, una legitimación del crimen organizado There a través de cuatro bloques de legitimación que serían estos cuatro bueno, estas estructuras de lo que se this lugar, organized crime, un, una uh, we have economic se trata de ganar legitimacy. El uh, no trata organized crime de wants to earn money. They're not trying dice, to give a service to people. Uh, well, the organized crime says, well, where there's no state, that's where I'm going. Where there's no uh, structures to fight me, that's where I'm going. I am... Charles, if I sí, run over time, um, please bueno, let me know. Si no, uh, no well, when when I'm over time, you eh, let me know. El crimen organizado, well, organized crime, their aim is economic profit. Más and obtiene, more economic profit means more power.
Esta es la base, por tanto, This is therefore de una organización the, criminal. The basis of a criminal organization. Pero vamos a ver cómo, But, si solo tuvieran este bloque de legitimación, they just had las organizaciones that, criminales serían fácilmente desechables. Criminal organizaciones serían fácilmente desechables. Sí, sí, you know, a lot of money, tanto, but you're a mafia boss, we can get rid of you. So they need to find a way to attractively insinuate themselves into bueno, society. No sé uh, how do they do it? Well, existiendo. I don't know exactly because they Pero continue to do it, but uh, I think we can say that the first thing they try to do after obtaining an economic profit is to legitimize themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis society. Uh, territorially speaking, uh, almost all mafia bosses uh, have a specific territory that they protect. And in Spain, for example, or Italy, those people who are most corrupt, first they do two things. One, They have an incredible luxurious mansion to show that they're there. And secondly, then they buy a soccer team. I'm not saying everyone who owns a soccer team are mafia bosses. Um, well, I'm a Real Madrid supporter, and it is an honorable soccer team. Este nivel social, well, this social level that goes from their little town starts to expand and they create uh, foundations. And they say that they're philanthropists. They say that they want to take care of people, be charitable, create legal foundations, medical foundations. They actually deceive people and get them into these foundations. And they select people who are well known to direct these foundations. Some are deceived. Others let themselves be deceived, and so they start to actually uh, have this web, this social web that they are able to create and bring people in. And then they realize that's not enough. Why? Because at the end, the police. In general. In general, el Estado the state sigue teniendo bien presente que su origen uh, understands that their origin is this economic origin. So they need to take care of their reputation, and they need to whitewash their reputation. Well, money laundering is fundamental for criminal organizations for many years, and now we've added the whitewashing or the laundering of their reputation. If you have incredible assets, you need to enjoy it, and they want to be ostentatious. They want to show it. They want to show they're enjoying it, and that they're normal people, and that's just Society needs to support them Hace and años, accept them. Ya, yo creo que unos uh, 70 años, I think 60 años. some 70, in 50, for the last 70 20, years, in, starting in the 50s, the Sicilian mafia de su uh, starts y se va desde el to rural, del ámbito, increase digamos, their activity, delictivo. they go into rural se areas, de su they de also get money from Uno the state. Es lo que One of the examples Palermo, is the pillaging y es, of Palermo. Uh, So these are mafiosos that are involved Antes in construction and they built un mafioso de verdad. Well, it, what used to be said that a, a true es, mafia uh, boss, a true kingpin, what they do is build a house un de and fútbol. buy again a soccer team. El well, any que, sport, que you, you know, it doesn't have to be Pero soccer. But when they, they, they build the house, they, they understand that the building itself, the construction is important, and, es and they continue in the construction sector, and we see that all over the world. Construction, no solo es de construction not just of buildings, highways, public works, and in the 50s, the Sicilian mafia realizes that they need to also go farther and devote themselves to getting profits from the state to get these contracts awarded to them. That's the second step. I think that uh, one step was uh, developed here. Um, 
tiene que ser una empresa. Y como empresa se trata la organización criminal. Really no to build así, a business, which is a criminal organization, eso, and that's what we have to see it as. So the fight against esencial. money laundering is no es essential, Tenemos but it's not the only fight, not the only front. We also have to fight against criminal activities and against corruption. Porque al haber esa relación and because this de la relationship mafia, de las organizaciones criminales uh, con las administraciones públicas uh, y la contracts, public el administration de and criminal organizations, well then the criminal organizations este come into contact with politicians. Perdón. And that what allows for this third uh, block of por una parte, legitimizing themselves. In other words, they are insinuating themselves into the political world. They even get legislation change. They penal, do this in plazos, legislation general, as far as crime is concerned. They say justice is slow. They Revisan get sentencing reduced. Penal, uh, they get uh, different uh, crimes de deleted de or eliminated from the criminal code. Incluso consiguen they even, entre social, criminal, político, que se les vayan limpiando de antecedentes penales. Between all these people penales, they have in their ejemplo, web, hemos uh, well, de we have, de have detected rusas, in our investigations of Russian crime organizations that uh, people who we know have police records have been able to have officials actually uh, make these police records disappear so they can actually have their records purged. El colmo ya es and si so, alguien hace un partido político y consigue que sea uh, eh, de una organización criminal. Bueno, pues eso va ocurriendo. Parties, the no es exactamente lo mismo, crime group. pero me van a decir this ustedes cómo occurred. haya um, algún partido político um, ruso, en concreto el Partido Liberal, de uh, uh, el señor Sirinovsky, cómo es posible que haya tenido allí well, how is it a determinados personas que han pertenecido party, o pertenecen a organizaciones uh, criminales. Has officials that ejemplo, belong to organized Mikhail crime, Monastisky. Mikhail Monastisky, who si no uh, died, but, and Mr. Voshenko, Incluso alguien, Even como el señor Lugovoy, que está acusado a por el like Mr. Lugovoy, who uh, has been accused of murdering Alexander Litvinenko. Y el último bloque de legitimación and finally, es un bloque sutil. Down here we have the more subtle legitimizing process for organized y crime. Y directamente con el blanqueo de capital. And this has to do directly with money laundering. De de and this is using de these large y de asesores fiscales financieros. firms of attorneys, of financial experts, and I'm also talking about financial and banking institutions, institutions that go against the prevention of money laundering. And this Estas is personas done in the economic sphere and other spheres. These people al ámbito político, al ámbito social, also uh, al have económico. ties to all these other blocks here: the economic, the social. Estas personas the public son administration. These are people who are experts and specialists in, in managing dicen, bueno, tax havens. No well, you bueno, can say tax havens don't exist. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. But these are areas, territories, in which mafia bosses and criminals can have assets. Que se oculta, which o are hidden or the ownership país. thereof is hidden Llamen from entonces, investigators of any country. So no, you can call them countries that don't collaborate or, or countries or territories uh, that um, are la, opaque. Uh, I'd like to give you an example, and this is really self-criticism. This is Spain, for España example. Spain su, su currently has Gibraltar. Well, temporarily it's British, but eh, Gibraltar, Gibraltar como un we no consider it to be an opaque, non-collaborating territory. And criminal organizations use Gibraltar uh, to actually hide their assets or the owners of assets. Nosotros en la 
en las investigaciones que hemos realizado, in the investigations we've las primeras undertaken, investigaciones que realiza Policía the Española first Guardia investigations Civil, done by the Civil Guard and the Police dirigidas directamente are investigations a that are o a quitar, directly aimed at eradicating the thieves in law, Borivas Cone, I'm sure the interpreter said it in English, estos señores eh, uh, ladrones en ley son en realidad la parte más baja de lo que es una organización really criminal. Es verdad que son los líderes, It, pero también es verdad que, leaders, que eh, así como en los años 90, eran quienes protegían 90s, they were the ones determinados that negocios y quienes, o bajo cuyo amparo, under whose bajo su protección, uh, se crearon auténticas riquezas, uh, wealth was con el paso del tiempo, With over time, especially as of 2000-2001, they pues start estamos pasando to los bloques de legitimación. act differently because they si started doing this. They, este es they, if uh, the thieves in law have ya tattoos no all over them, they can't do any of these legitimizing activities. You've got to remove normal. your tattoos, you have to en be este a normal sentido, person. And so es que I always speak in masculine, I say he because they're men. Que ver por qué. And we'd have to look at why. But eh, the thieves in law have really become a species in danger of en extinction. En Rusia, and they flourished in Russia. And now they've almost been exterminated. exterminated and that's part of the collaboration we've received from the el Office of the Prosecutor in Russia to eradicate them. But there are eh, some thieves in law una, un tatuaje, who've never had a tattoo, llaman, and those eh, are the ones that have bought the title of thieves in law, ley, and eh, these thieves in law, sí que están they indeed are legitimizing their activities. We have an investigation with regard Mr., uh, to Mr. Vladimir Turin. He is a thief in law. He was investigated in for drug trafficking in the UK and in Spain for leading the Abraskaya clan, a criminal organization, and currently the Russian prosecutor asked us to transfer the file from Spain to Russia because we were not able to get him extradited back to Spain, and we trust that the prosecutor's office in Russia uh, will continue with investigation. Um, there are people la gestión de lavado de reputación have... y de legitimación whitewashed his reputation and laundered his money. The investigation is ongoing because if Russia does not investigate him, uh, we will take this back up. Pero hay una serie de líderes But there are a series of leaders no of criminal organizations butres, tan como uh, los which go beyond this. They're not as vulgar en as these thieves in law. Troika, uh, we had an operation called op uh, Troika Operation de de in Spain, Nacional and the National Police and Civil Guard junio, arrested junio. several people in uh, June of 2008. Que se llama Petrov. And then there's Gennady Petrov, who was arrested. He has fled Spain, grandes empresarios, um, and he had contacts Abramov, with Mr. Abramov, Mr. Mahmoudov. These are all very high-level businessmen. O de calidad, um, eh, familiar, the económica, relationship he had with them was very familiar. It was based on a business relationship also. And we heard and read how Mr. Petrov also had a relationship with the then Minister of Defense, Serdukov, and that Mr. Serdukov was actually subordinate to Mr. Petrov. We heard him speak to him in friendly terms to also to Mr. Raymond, to other people uh, who are not part of the administration, but they are part of the power structure in Russia. And that is concerning another person uh, who we were investigating uh, was Mr. Uh, Nikolai Nikolaevich Abramov, who was a general in Russia, and he was responsible for fighting drug trafficking in Russia. And we actually sent 
his file back to Russia. Um, and then Mr. Igor Sabalevsky. Well, thankfully, the prosecutor's office in Russia thinks the information that we gave them has gone after Mr. Sabalevsky. Hemos visto, por tanto, esa Therefore, we have seen this relationship con, between eh, organized crime con y con uh, to rusa. the public administration y, in Russia realidad, and politicians in Russia. And so, in reality, eh, uh, what, we're, what, we, what you're doing is throwing pues, stones eh, no. at the Russian public administration. No. La, Indeed, la de una es reconocer que hay an administration hay, needs to recognize if there's corruption therein, and if that is the case, they need to clean it up. And in Spain, we've had recent arrests of a former minister en España, in Spain, y aquí nadie está and que no one here is saying that the anti-corruption prosecutor este caso, or the civil la guard la that arrested this former minister is undermining the Spanish public administration to the contrary. Contrary, we, this is legitimizing the democracy of Spain's government and administration. Por último, Finally, les voy a, eh, las que I'd like en la to lucha talk about the capitales. difficulties we have in fighting money laundering. Nosotros, eh, Hemos detectado, we have como decía antes, detected, as que I said previously, that de las we need to legitimize at a constante. democratic level no es que our institutions. No this is an ongoing effort. Pero es verdad que it's ha habido true una cierta, that eh, that there's been pensando some que el estado democrático llevaba por sí mismo people who la no feel relaxed that just because they're in democracy antes, we're not going to have corruption que, que no, well que no that is not the case democratic corrupt. politicians uh, can also y be corrupted and officials of a democratic corrupt. regime can be corrupted nos hemos dado cuenta, por ejemplo, we have realized en un for example in, los in, in los que, one of the proceedings uh, that we have taken forward uh, which has to do with the corruption of a political eh, party eh, in Catalonia. They're called Convergencia Democrática de Catalonia. We saw that they were systematically corrupt. And es una tesis de la Fiscalía Española, the pero es una tesis thesis que, uh, put de la forward in that regard de la is what que vamos the a poder civil guard thinks, it's what the prosecutor's office thinks, but we think we're going to be able to prove this in court. And so this is another example of how the Catalan society and Spanish society doesn't want to recognize that their administration is corrupt. Uh, um, and we think that how it was possible that political party was able to lead up the cry for independence. And we see horrible corruption, corruption that stole money from all the taxpayers, from all our citizens. Now, again, they have not been convicted, this political party, but this is our theory. Now, also we have these difficulties of social perception, but another difficulty we face is collaboration. Cooperation. I began by speaking about the cooperation we have with the United States. We have a cooperation agreement that dates from 2010. We also have cooperation from law enforcement, civil guard, national police, the customs agency, and also we have Mossos de Escuadra, which are the police from Catalonia. We have a wonderful relationship with the United States. Por mucho que saliera en Wikileaks, well, que somos el brazo ejecutor de Estados Unidos, y por supuesto, no somos el brazo ejecutor de nadie, salvo de la sociedad española. Pero hay muy buena colaboración. Esa colaboración es la que deseamos con todos los países, y determinados países no colaboran. Uh, Hemos tenido problemas like serios de colaboración en el ámbito del crimen organizado, que no son drogas, con el Reino Unido. Problemas muy serios. Tenemos problemas de que siguen existiendo uh, esos of drug trafficking. We see that there are still tax havens or those opaque, non-collaborative territories, as I mentioned. And we have problems getting cooperation from Holland and Belgium. We have serious issues in fighting organized crime because of this. 
eh, un deseo, es un pronóstico uh, seguro, uh, que así como Reino Unido está reaccionando sí, de una manera, digamos, eh, severa, de una manera eficaz a la contaminación económica que han podido tener de algunos de los llamados oligarcas que llevan dinero sucio, que llevan dinero take, negro, uh, que llevan dinero, no nos engañemos, dirty money que llevan dinero de una organización Money criminal from a criminal organization, que está muchas clear, detrás the, which is de lo que puede ser una empresa, a business, incluso una empresa, una empresa importante even con an, actividad an legal important y con actividad además lucrativa. Uh, Las organizaciones criminales no blanquean ya activity. con una criminal empresa pantalla sin actividad. Blanquean a uh, grandes empresas. Uh, uh, are grandes empresas. Money through large Por eso es por lo que tenemos que hacer una vigilancia exhaustiva de esta parte. La parte jurídica part, financiera de cada uno de nuestros países. Legal financial part. That piece. Thank you very much. Sebastian, do you have any? Uh, Well, thank, thank you, Judge Grinda. Um, Sebastian Rotella is going to say a few words. Uh, Sebastian is currently with ProPublica and knows Judge Grinda well and has written about uh, his cases and uh, uh, related subjects and uh, speaks Spanish fluently. Uh, and so he'll say a few words. Then Ben Judah is with us, and as, as some of you know, the, the UK was just criticized in ways that Ben would like to reform and has been working on that, and there's been some recent action in the UK, as some of you know, in the last 10 days that's uh, a little bit promising, at least. Uh, and then we'll have a brief discussion. Uh, it's already 10 of 11. We will leave plenty of time for your questions, given that we have such a, an extraordinarily distinguished audience, and there are many familiar faces, and there are many non-familiar faces, which is great. It's not the usual kleptocracy initiative fan club. So we're very happy to, to see you. Welcome. Uh, Sebastian? Sure. <coughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Charles, and to be here. It's an honor to be here with, with Jose Grinda and talk a little bit about my perspective on this as the son of um, the American son of Spanish and Italian immigrants. I spent a lot of time in Spain for uh, personal and professional reasons, and I've covered organized crime and, and terrorism and intelligence around the world. But last year, when I got an assignment from ProPublica to really look at, at Russia-related questions in Europe, um, I, I chose Spain, and that hopefully as a place it would be a window into this global phenomenon, because I knew the language, because I knew a lot of people in law enforcement, and I had sort of been following some of these cases without going in depth. And so I got a chance to spend time with Jose Grinda, with people in the police, Guardia Civil, other, other agencies, and see, explore some of the places where some of these interesting cases had happened. And in fact, what is remarkable is that the Spanish experience over the past 10, 15 years, really it, this body of casework details the history of the evolution of, the, of Russian organized crime overseas, not just in Spain, and, and it reveals in, in, in remarkable detail that these are power networks that go beyond traditional organized crime, that we're talking about a, a blurring or a blending of organized crime, intelligence, politics, and business. And, um, and I think the Spanish experience, is, is, as Jose Grinda described, is really a, a roadmap, a model for, for how to fight uh, this urgent global threat. Um, a couple of points of perspective that I think are interesting. One to remember is that the, the, the Russian mafia comes in the 90s and the early 2000s to, to Spain um, looking for safety because of the, the intensity of the, the wars back home, investment opportunities. It was a country that was booming, particularly in construction and real estate, and uh, part, as part of a global uh, expansion. This was a global diaspora of organized crime. And Spain is, we should remember, a prosperous safe and civilized country. It has one of the lowest homicide rates in, in uh, Europe. And it has tough and effective law enforcement with very uh, a justice system that with a lot of guarantees and the progressive uh, prison policies. So there, there were a lot of reasons it was, it was attractive. And as this presence increased, 
what you should remember, this is a very small number of starting out in the late 90s, early 2000s. We're talking about small numbers of investigators who become concerned and begin this this difficult fight. And having t worked with law enforcement around the world, one thing that I've always been impressed by by very good investigators is that they're very frank when they say they're they're happy to say I don't know or I don't know this topic well or I'm just learning, even when they're great experts. And that was one thing that impressed me when talking to Jose Grinda and others who have become experts on this issue is that they're very candid about the fact that in the beginning, this was, this was not a world they knew a lot about. And they say, we made a lot of mistakes and we really had to, had to learn. We had a lot of obstacles. And they've come a long way because this was a different model of organized crime compared to what they were used to. You know, Spain is a crossroads for drug trafficking, so they dealt with Latin American mafias, with the Italian mafia. But this was an entirely different model. You know, a lot of these people who were showing up presented themselves as wealthy, successful businessmen. And so the investigators had to learn how to, um, how to take on these groups, uh, how to understand them. They had to educate their own judiciary about this threat, which is rather subtle. They had to prove crimes that were crimes that were happening often uh, the, the money that was being laundered because of crimes that had happened elsewhere. They were dealing with enemies who, on the one hand, were, were very dangerous and had great firepower, but on the other, practiced strategic restraint, many of them, so they weren't committing violent crimes in Spain. They, uh, these were mafias with what seemed to be unlimited resources, with some of the best lawyers and financial advisors that Spain could, um, that Spain could offer. And they had difficulties with, as much as, as Jose talks about some of the collaboration, it, what's clear is they had difficulties with Russia and some of these other countries where the Eurasian mafias came from as, as trustworthy partners. But they began to understand the dimensions of these groups that range from armies of burglars at the lowest level uh, operating throughout Europe to people, as you heard, who had direct partnerships with people in, at the cabinet level in Russia, uh, worldwide uh, money laundering networks. And I think what Jose Grinda and the others did really have been, were pioneers in cooperation, both in Spain, which wasn't necessarily easy. If you followed Spanish law enforcement, there were times when there were division among the other agencies, and, and Jose and others have really had to coordinate among agencies, and international cooperation. I think one thing they realized was that they had to learn about these groups, and they had to work with uh, with a lot of other international partners that this fight was going to be successful. So working, as you heard, with Americans, with European law enforcement, and to the extent possible with Russia and, and other countries. Um, and what they were worried about was the danger of infiltration. And in Spain, there were some dangerous signs. You saw that these mafias in the 90s and 2000s were starting to expand into areas like banking, into areas like business. There was a particular presence in the energy sector of bona fide gangsters trying to muscle into the Spanish energy sector. Uh, at one point, it reached the presidential level in Spain that a, an attempt by Gazprom and Luke Oil, uh, the Russian energy companies, to move into the Spanish market was blocked because it was seen as a national security threat. And as you heard, uh, soccer is not only a huge cultural phenomenon, but a huge business in Spain. And one of the signs that you could talk about about this infiltration, and, and I know uh, Jose is a fan of Real Madrid, so I'm, he's going to be happy to hear me talk about the Barcelona soccer team, which is their great rival. Uh, the chief of security for the Barca soccer team, one of the most wealthy and, and best-known soccer teams in the world, was a convicted Georgian drug trafficker at, at a certain point in the 2000s. And the head of the Marbella soccer team, who Jose is prosecuting now, is a Russian who's accused now, of been arrested a few months ago, of, uh, of money laundering and mafia activity. And they found also inroads of, in, into politics and the police. There are some cases where corrupt Spanish police officers tipped off uh, targets of, uh, of the special prosecutor's office uh, of their investigations. There was a moment when the uh, Catalan politician who was convicted a couple of years ago, um, his appointment to direct the Catalan Regional Police, which is 16,000 officers in one of the most important and prosperous regions in the country, um, he was convicted of being an accomplice of the Russian mafia, uh, and, his, and, and he would have, the Russian mafia would have had an accomplice running the Catalan, Catalan Regional Police. So it shows you some of the, the things they were coming up against. But I think Spain's crackdown is interesting because it's been one of the most sustained and systematic. 
but, and, and, and they've arrested some of the most important bosses, uh, Russian or Eurasian mafia bosses outside of, uh, ever arrested outside of, uh, of Russia, including uh, Kalashov, uh, the, the Georgian kingpin. Um, they've led Europe-wide investigations of a particularly murderous uh, Georgian mafia, uh, which to show you just the kind of obstacles they were up against when the Spanish warrants are executed throughout Europe uh, in Greece, uh, one of the wanted suspects in Spain, a Georgian, uh, pays an $800,000 cash bribe, allegedly, and managed to escape from the Greek police who were coming to arrest him on, on behalf of the Spanish. And you heard about the Petrov case, which is now uh, a trial of some of those people is awaiting a verdict, which is, in my estimation, uh, and I know there are probably experts here who know other cases, but is one of the strongest, most interesting cases in a Western court system that details the workings and the evidence of high-level corruption in the Putin regime, where you have the Spanish are able to intercept phone calls, not just in Spain, but of people as they travel back to Russia and hear bona fide gangsters treating cabinet ministers as business partners and treating people like the police general you heard about as flunkies, and just the, the, the depth and the breadth and the specificity of the way that, that threat that combines these different sectors of crime and intelligence and politics and business the way it works. Um, and there's also, I think, just to finish, they, the Spanish have taken a very aggressive premise, which is if there's a piece of an international organization in their territory, they follow it to the top. So some of the oligarchs who have recently been sanctioned in the United States uh, in the past weeks uh, are people who Jose Grinda and others have been investigating for years and in some cases have prosecuted, in other cases have at least been able to question. Uh, and they're cases that shed light on all kinds of interesting things. Some of them are former partners of Paul Manafort, who, uh, as you know, is in the news these days. Um, some of them are, uh, one of them is under investigation, uh, Alexander Torshin, for uh, reportedly under investigation for ties to the Trump campaign and potential illegal financing. So again, the Spanish case is, really give you a, it, it's, it's a window that you have to think about going beyond the Spanish borders. It gives you a window into all kinds of international activity. Not always, the cases have not always been successful. Uh, sometimes they start out as big operations and the results have not been, uh, have ultimately been rather meager. But I think there's no question that they have disrupted and dismantled and challenged these mafias um, and, and, and these larger structures in a way that's, that's impressive. And one thing that I think is ironic is we know a lot about the Russian mafia in Spain precisely because there's been so much activity on this front. But I would argue that if you look at Europe and you look at countries like the UK or Greece or Germany, or maybe you hear less about it, there are places where there's a lot of work left to do. Um, and I think the Spanish model of cooperation uh, is one is one that 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 you know that should be emulated. And you know, just in closing. Um, there's an expression I first heard, uh, the vita blindata, which is an expression used in Sicily, which means the armored life, which is the life that prosecutors and cops who fight the mafia live, always being surrounded by bodyguards, always being aware of both physical threats and of the treachery and, and attempts to, it, to, it, to, you know, to pressure them and to attack them. And it's the, it's the, the expression in Spanish is very similar, la vida blindada. Uh, and I, you hear it in Latin America all the time, too, about people fighting the same fight. But that's the fight that people like Jose and his colleagues have chosen, and I think it's very admirable. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on this uh, panel with him today. Thank you. Thank you, Seb Sebastian. Uh, ben, does this bring any comments or questions to mind? Um, well, well, first I'd like to thank uh, our guests for such a panoramic uh, tour de force through Russia and Spain and really sort of bringing to light not only the severity of the problem but the power that these organizations uh, now possess. I'd like to make a few uh, maybe possibly slightly more wonkish comments about what could be done in the United States in order to tackle this problem and what policy approach is you should urgently be pushing for um, uh, in this country. When one studies the kind of chains of um, how these activities operate, one always finds the anonymous company. One finds the legal entity 
or the legal entity of uh, LLCs, the legal entity of the corporation stripped down to its purest uh, form of simply a sort of sheet of paper or digital imprint being used anonymously to cover up crime and to cover up the sort of proceeds of crime. And it's really urgent that the United States pushes to abolish uh, the existence of anonymous companies uh, in this country. Not only should it do that, it should also make deliberately misleading uh, incorporation agents or their equivalents when creating these anonymous companies a uh, criminal offence. And FinCEN should establish a dedicated inspection unit for incorporation uh, agents and their equivalents to make sure there's effective compliance. Because as long as you can hide the identity of somebody controlling an asset or the individual linked to the asset behind a cloud of anonymity. It makes the work of people like um, sort of Jose Grinder uh, Gonzalez extremely difficult, and it makes the life of a mafia kingpin extremely easy. How does one deal with these questions of infiltration of uh, that we were uh, discussing? Well, uh, the United States already has the Foreign Agents uh, Registration Act, but this piece of legislation dating from uh, the sort of um, the struggle against uh, fascism needs to be radically uh, updated. We have been arguing here that the DOJ needs to introduce a comprehensive FARA enforcement strategy and that Congress should finally allocate sufficient resources for its implementation. Because if you want to be serious about fighting organized crime and defending national security, one needs to provide the resources to do it. Um, we, it's also really essential that loopholes, where lobbyists can sometimes register under different um, Disclosure acts should be consolidated, and that the time for, and that the time frames for registration and penalties for sort of late filings are uh, enforced. You want, we also think that um, it's absolutely essential when it comes to addressing these problems that the the current incomplete, broken, not fit for purpose in any meaningful sense, anti-money laundering system in this country is fully modernized. The anti-money laundering system in this country is, was designed in order, in order to combat uh, cocaine cowboys in Miami in the 1980s operating essentially with cash. And it's not fit, essentially, to do anything else apart from catch those people. What needs to be done is there needs to be an extension of the anti-money laundering system away from simply focusing on banks, but focusing on other high-risk sectors which are not covered by anti-money laundering requirements, such as the ones listed by um, Jose Grindo Gonzalez. The real estate, uh, in, the real estate industry, uh, uh, lawyers, and other sort of luxury, uh, luxury industries, or possibly including the, the soccer industry. And again, we have a, a fundamental need for resources to be put behind these questions. And something that I find uh, spending, spending time in uh, Washington is we have still a deeply 20th century, a 1956 understanding of what is a national security threat in which when the United States faces problems that uh, could potentially come in the form of an F-16 or a tank or uh, something atomic or chemical, full resources are deployed in order to counteract even the possibility of such a threat. When a national security threat comes in the form of, uh, comes in the form of uh, dirty money, or it comes in in the pinstripe suit of a lawyer or of a lo or of a lobbyist. Extremely little, practically no resources are put towards checking this threat, and we need to have more resources given to the Treasury and more resources given to law enforcement in order to deal uh, with this. There's a deeper problem at play in the United States, which Spain. Uh, doesn't face, which is a balkanized bureaucracy, 
And when you have up to over a dozen institu uh, institutions in this country with overlapping uh, goals and agendas, um, duplicate uh, staff, all trying to deal with financial regulations, it doesn't help you. It helps the it helps the sort of criminal it helps the criminal uh, side of things, and that there needs to be in the long term regulatory consolidation for uh, matters to do with organised crime and financial uh, regulation. It may not be possible at the moment, but it needs to be done. Is that there need it in an environment a complex institutional environment? There needs to be issued policy doctrines coming from the White House, and if the White House is unable or unwilling to do so, to issue policy doctrines about how to combat kleptocracy, then Congress needs to set up a commission that can outline its own strategy. And looking further afield, the United States needs to develop approaches where it can highlight the core national security uh, danger of organized crime and Russian organized crime and implement these strategies into NATO, into collaboration with the European Union, and embed it in its diplomatic approach to countries which are uh, at, which countries which are very much uh, at risk. Core long term, because I I'd like to sort of echo what um, sort of Jose Grindo Gonzalez says about how fighting Russian organized crime is not fighting the Russian people. It, it's, uh, it, there needs to be a, a raising awareness of kleptocracy in Russia. And one policy which I think could be very effective would be consolidating frozen assets from Russian organized crime or Russian kleptocracy into a fund for the Russian people, the sums of which would be clearly visible online and uh, which could sort of sit there until a time in which uh, Russia has sort of returned to the rule of law. And it, it, needs, to be, you know, the, it needs to be made extremely clear that uh, Western law enforcement is working to save funds stolen from the Russian people for the benefit of the, the Russian people. Uh, perhaps a kind of closing uh, remark about raising awareness in Russia is the importance of numbers. And uh, when you sort of study this field or when you study how this, uh, these issues are reported, um, there's a lack of concrete numbers. And one thing that the Treasury and that the relevant institutions can do is release regularly updated figures of how much money they think is being stolen from uh, Russia and how much they believe this is costing the Russian people to make people aware of these uh, gigantic uh, costs. Well, so I'd like to sort of once again to thank uh, uh, our, our panelists for, uh, for coming here today. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. I should mention that much of which um, Ben just described is contained in a report that we released recently called Countering Russian Kleptocracy, which Ben co-authored with Nate Sibley, who can raise his hand, perhaps. And um, uh, we, we need to give Nate a big thanks for helping to organize this event and all sorts of related activities and logistics uh, in terms of uh, Judge Grinda's uh, visit. So thank you, Nate. Uh, Nate deserves a, a big hand. And Nate is the program manager of the Kleptocracy Initiative and does everything from co-authoring reports, writing op-eds, to organizing events. And he also produces this daily brief that we put out, which is a lot of trouble. And we have wanted to, to sort of stop doing it for months and months and months. But it, it, people keep telling us it's so useful that Nate uh, is stuck doing it. And, and a lot of the people who are real actors in the uh, sort of anti-kleptocracy space, to, to put it perhaps more specifically than I should, uh, read this. So uh, we keep doing it. And uh, this is, Nate spends a couple hours a day on that. So I hope you're, many of you may be signed up for it. And if not, I hope you. Yeah. And are, are, are any of our reports out there, Nate? They're all out there. OK, so I should say about countering Russian kleptocracy that this isn't necessarily about Russia only. It's really about countering kleptocracy in general. Uh, but we thought we'd give it 
a specific vivid title because that does seem to be the clear and present danger that people uh, recognize. But it's meant uh, to have general applicability. And of course, there's nothing at all anti-Russian about it, quite the contrary. So I think, given the time, we will, we will turn to you and take some questions. Uh, if it's a comment, we, it has to be extremely brief. And, um, and then we may zing one or two things around. And I'm told we can go a little bit beyond 11.30. So that depends on, on your availability. Uh, as the audience uh, shrinks to uh, a, an embarrassing size, we will uh, stop. So uh, please, now there will be a microphone or multiple microphones floating around. And if you could please identify yourself by name and affiliation. Uh, we will take it from there. Sir. Hello, my name is Alexei Bogdanovsky. I'm a reporter with uh, the Russian news agency RIA Novosti. And uh, my question is for Mr. Grina Gonzalez. Um, you displayed in court in April some threatening messages to you and spoke about uh, threats. I just wanted to to ask you to speak in that regard, uh, how uh, how your life changed uh, after this uh, investigation began? Do you need to take precautions in everyday life? Uh, uh, what they are exactly? And the second question is, uh, what's the level of your cooperation with the Russian law enforcement and uh, um, prosecutors? Uh, you mentioned that in some of the cases you're uh, pretty sure that they will uh, continue the investigation against some uh, uh, people that you're indicted, but probably in other cases it's not so. Thank you. Um, thank you. Los ataques que recibimos. Aquellas personas que investigamos crimen organizado en general y personas en particular como yo, en general, y personas en particular como mí, son dos tipos. Lo que llamamos sería First, la, el reverso o la otra parte de la limpieza de la reputación sería uh, eh, el ensuciamiento de la reputación. A mí me lo han Francamente, me da igual porque tengo el respaldo honestly, de... de I'm supported by my agency española. and by the Spanish eh, government. De física, and then a second threat is a physical no threat. I can't really say what's happening uh, because there's an investigation matarme. against y those y that order my my killing, and I can't really talk about someone who uh, is, eh, wants to kill me. I don't want to smear him. I don't. <laughs> In any case, en a, a mi I'm social, quite confident regarding my social reputation and I'm also quite confident regarding my personal integrity because my agency, the prosecutor's office, the national police are working hard on my secure, providing me with security. I really live in peace. And then regarding your second part of the question, our collaboration with the Russian law enforcement, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Respecto a la colaboración de la Fiscalía Rusa, Regarding sí, ya he dicho que tenemos una colaboración. The, with the police itself, I don't know. And with the prosecutor's eh, office, yes, we do have collaboration on a permanent co basis, but it's Rusa, not homogeneous. Sometimes, if we don't feed the prosecutor's office, they cannot chew. Uh, Fabiola Córdoba, with the National Endowment for Democracy. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question about Venezuela and Andorra, and if this is a topic of interest for the prosecutor's office and whether you are investigating this. Well, if I start talking about that, I think only three people will be left in the audience because we'll be here for five, six hours or maybe a few days even. 
Bueno, por, por eliminar y por, y por, por ser un poco breve, porque si no, brief, es, es tremendo. Si porque es un tema muy grande. Andorra no tiene un problema. Andorra, Entonces, para mí Andorra, well, eh, el problema que, que tuvo con la banca privada de Andorra the es un problema eh, muy, 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 muy específico, es muy aislado. Isolated. Y tuvo mucha repercusión porque It el sistema bancario de Andorra had great repercussions eh, tuvo una gran fragilidad en ese momento, the banking system pero no was fragilized at that point, but it's not systemic. En Andorra, And España tiene una colaboración Andorra, excepcional. We have wonderful cooperation with Andorra, both with the police as well as the prosecutor's office. Judicial, at a judicial a level, de una colaboración de la que no he hablado antes, well que es muy importante, que son las unidades de inteligencia financiera, como puede ser aquí la FinCEN, como esa, y en Andorra, like the one we have with FinCEN, in other words, the financial bueno. intelligence units, y and that's very important, that kind of cooperation. La de la banca privada Andorra, the pues no sé si es desproporcionado o no, pero lo que sí sé es que en la relación Andorra, de venezolanos uh, que estaban now, eh, como clientes de la banca privada Andorra, Venezuelans no who were clients of Andorran banks, well, that relationship could exist anywhere in the world. No I think the private banking in Andorra was not a problem that es just was a problem of Venezuelans. Venezuelans. Well, what is the problem of Venezuelans? Well, I need hours to talk about that briefly. The justice system has ongoing investigations in Spain with regard to Venezuelans that have been stealing money from Venezuela who are responsible for the impoverishment of the Venezuelan people. And so we are cooperating with Andorra, Portugal, and the U.S. in this sense. And we hope and I'm not la, being ironic here. We hope to have the cooperation of Venezuelan prosecutors. And so what are we talking about here as far as stealing money is concerned? I'm just going to give you an example. I think that as of the declaration of the emergency situation in 2010, there were a series of contracts with electric plants to generate electricity. Venezuelan politicians. We're talking about people in the U.S., people in Venezuela, although most of the people in Venezuela came to the United States and they are subject to investigation in the U.S. and there are suits and reports against Venezuelans in Venezuela because they are responsible for the impoverishment of the Venezuelan people. I think we missed the name and affiliation there. Okay, thank you. Uh, the dis disheveled gentleman in the second row. A ver, este señor aquí. Hi, uh, my name is Glenn. Soy. Uh, and I run a research company here in Washington. Um, my question is about Alexander Torshin. Uh, I wanted like to know, uh, I think Sebastian and others have reported that he appears to have been tipped off to his uh, uh, arrest warrant in Spain. I wanted to know if any progress has been made in figuring out who tipped him off, how he found out about it, whether he's been put on an Interpol red notice, uh, and finally, whether you've shared information with the U.S. government about Mr. Torshin and his suspected criminal activities. Well, as soon as I say it, I'll give you the word. Well, as soon as I take the floor, I think that I can answer that. Alexander Torshin was subject to investigation in Spain for his arrest in Mallorca. 
la investigación estaba a cargo de la policía, de, perdón, de la Guardia Civil the civil guard y de la Fiscalía de Corrupción. The investigation along with the y la Fiscalía de Corrupción tiene uno de sus office. delegados, Juan Caral, que es un delegado en Mallorca. Uh, well, and he is y él era of the junto in Mallorca, conmigo, and yo junto con él, I, él era el principal Uh, worked with him, he was heading up the investigation, and that's why the investigation was successful. We investigated torsion. ¿Por qué? Pues porque Why? se relacionaba con un señor que se Because llama Hermanov, que está condenado actualmente en España y fue condenado por un rider en Hermanov. Rusia. Who has been convicted, or Romanov, excuse me. Um, and it seemed to us that there was criminal activity going on to the extent that uh, 22nd of August, I think it was 2013, uh, he was waiting for Mr. Torshin to go to the birthday of Mr. Romanov in Mallorca. And if Torshin had arrived, we would have actually detained him at the airport. Why? Because we have a telephone conversations eh, that were intercepted under that investigation that uh, led us to believe that he was laundering money uh, of the Tkatskaya criminal organization. And, well, the FBI also has linked him to Rabinovich and Sinoklev. And both Romanov and Torshin talked about these two people uh, as if they knew them, as if they were friends. And currently, Mr. Romanov has been convicted. He actually um, had a plea bargain with the prosecutor's office, so we didn't investigate Torshin because what we had at first, which was clear evidence against him, Procedimos a la detención well, del señor Romanov en diciembre de 2014, si no recuerdo, se fueron desvaneciendo estos indicios. Uh, well, de manera que no hay acusación formal, no hubo acusación formal contra well, el señor Torsin kind of y evidentemente no hubo una emisión de un indictment against him, nor were there, was there an international order issued against him either. Uh, gentlemen over there. Stephen Blank, American Foreign Policy Council. My question's for the panel. To what degree do you see linkages or even actual uh, to, uh, both sides wearing the same hat with regard to organized crime and media penetration in Europe? Should we give that right to the judge? Pues, eh, no lo conozco, la verdad. Well, I don't know, really. Lo que sí sé es que los But medios de comunicación know forman parte de, de la defensa del Estado. Es una... Es una participación que realmente tiene que ser activa, muy activa. Very active participation that the media has to take on, and that exists in Spain. Coordinación, that coordination de Estado, coordinación más que de Estado, more than just of coordination of interest of the state, but rather of the country of the society. En España, que yo sepa, in other words, an alignment. No in in Spain, as far as I know, there's been no infiltration of organized crime in media outlets. In Europe, I do not know. I have no idea. In our investigations in Spain, we have not been attacked by uh, the media, with some few exceptions of, if I may use the word, asshole media outlets. And that is an insult, by the way. Entonces es verdad que ha habido algún periodista so que en concreto been me ha atacado a mí. Specific journalists who have no attacked es que me. And and that's not why he's an pero, asshole necessarily. Pero sí es porque ha recibido but, a, a dinero. No, it's no because it was for sea, money. Eh, that's manera, why they did it, not Entonces, because of my character. Claro, cuando yo digo que so, que no me consta, a lo mejor dice bueno, no quiero decirlo. Know, no, that, no, no, de verdad, es que Perhaps no, you no think I don't want to say that. No, I just I really have no idea. Like to emphasize this is just a translation issue that we just experienced. It's not, uh, not the usual language uh, we use, use around here. Do we have... Uh, me, oh, yes, yeah, Sebastian's going to come. No, just on the media point. I mean, I have, haven't covered Latin America where I saw cases of, of journalists or even 
media outlets being directly instruments of the mafia in one way or the other connected to drug cartels or, or to intelligence services, things like that. I haven't seen, certainly in Western Europe, I haven't seen that. But there are cases in some countries where people, you know, oligarchs or people connected to them or with, with shady ties have moved, have acquired media-related businesses, no? And so there you start to wonder. <clears throat> and the other thing would be to the extent that there are political parties uh, in, in Europe, uh, including in countries like Italy and France that have strong connections to and are sympathetic with uh, the, the, the regime in Russia um, and have gone as far, important political leaders in some of those countries saying things like they don't believe that the Skripal poisoning in Salisbury uh, was, uh, that countries don't do that. They're, they don't believe that any country would try to poison somebody like that. To the extent that political leaders who have media that are sympathetic to them or to have some relations with them are taking that line, you could see how that, that could start to seep in. And, and certainly the other thing that you've seen, and, and for example, in the Catalan crisis, and this isn't really media, but the kind of fake news, bots, uh, propaganda activity uh, that has been attributed to, to Russian connected forces in other parts of the West were certainly on display, a lot of uh, objective analysts have said, in, in Catalonia. So that's certainly worrisome in terms of fake news, trying to in the seek, uh, continuing what has seemed to be a strategy of fomenting division and separatist movements and political conflict and chaos and all that. And I think that was been very much on display in, in the Catalan crisis uh, in a bombardment of fake news, which was connected partly through Venezuela, actually, uh, seen as a Russian-Venezuelan uh, connection. Um, well, just, just, to sort of re just to sort of reiterate the points about how to deal with this uh, problem, like the first essential tool is transparency. You need to bring as much transparency as possible in order to reveal situations like this happening in the media, and that means bringing transparency to corporate structures. It means bringing transparency to tax declarations in order to help law enforcement do its job. A second thing that we really need is reporting requirements, more reporting requirements, in order to make sure money laundering is not happening on sectors that are not covered, you know, like... Um, like sort of uh, property, like lawyers, like hedge funds, you need capacity building. We don't have enough people dealing with this. You have a handful of people working as bank examiners, but then you have tens of thousands of people working on, frankly, redundant national security uh, issues just because that's how the bureaucratic inertia works. One thing that we, I didn't talk about last time is we really need legal tools. Something that's been created in the United Kingdom is an unexplained wealth order, which pl places the sort of onus on an individual from one of these at-risk countries in order to explain where his wealth comes from. And that's something you urgently need to uh, bring um, here. You need integration of these topics into the national security framework and international security um, doctrines. But finally, there is this question of the fourth uh, estate and whether it, even though the fourth estate not, might not feature as a classical branch of uh, sort of political theory when it comes to understanding a democratic system, it functions as such. And when we are seeing in Europe and in North America uh, monopolistic oligopoly uh, online platforms which are destroying the ability of the fourth estate to finance itself, thus are destroying the ability of uh, journalist, journalism to be funded. We need to move so that these, um, pla these monopoly platforms are forced, that are, are forced to either remunerate platforms for the content that they drive their clicks from uh, allowing people to share, or that they pay taxes uh, pay, ta pay higher taxes, which can then be used to support um, support journalism in the manner of the BBC or other European uh, formats, and allowing these monopoly online platforms to operate in the, the way they do is full stop bad for democracy and bad for fighting organised crime. Any other questions, sir? Okay. Uh, just we'll get the microphone to you. Voy a hablar en español. Can you identify yourself and yep. uh, you I'm uh, Javier Ruperes. I'm Javier Ruperes. I was ambassador from, of Spain 2004. to the United States between 2001 and 2004. Um, 
La, la primera vez que oí hablar the de first time Grinda I heard about Prosecutor Grinda was in a book by Karen de Visha, que era una, uh, regular who en esta was casa, a regular presence here and en estos who we regret um, has died. Karen libro, She wrote a book uh, que se llamaba which was called Putin's Kleptocracy. Putin's kleptocracy, en donde hacía una mención muy favorable and eh, al Grinda favorably talked about Prosecutor sus, Grinda, uh, and she hailed all of his actions taken de la, de la rusa. against the Russian y mafia. En un libro que por otra parte ha sido solo and en Estados Unidos, this book has only been published in the United Unido States no because in the UK they didn't dare no publish it. They were concerned that there would be a libel suit filed. And she said that the problem isn't that the mafia exists in Russia, but that the state is a mafia state and that the head of that mafia organization or state is Vladimir Putin. So it's a criminal state, she asserted. Not just a criminal gang or one more criminal gang. And do you share this analysis, uh, what uh, Ms. Devisha put forward, her thesis? Do you share this? Um, do I have to deal with this? OK. <laughs> Well, there's a book in Spain. It was written by a media outlet, ABC. It's, it's a newspaper in Spain. Cruz Morcillo, Pablo Muñoz. Uh, well, the name of the book is The Word of Vor, Word of Thieves. Yo tengo que hablar como, como um, fiscal. I have to speak as a prosecutor. Eh, yo no he detectado en investigaciones eh, in en España my investigations in Spain, una convalidación. I have not absoluta. validated that yo thesis, aquí, not at all. What I have said is that what we perceive is that there is a very high level of corruption y, in Russia. Y nosotros lo hemos combatido. We have been fighting against Rusia. that, and in part with cooperation of Russian no prosecutors. The rest is, well, uh, Yo recuerdo your reading of it, believing certain con, con people. Um, Mr. Libinenko, for example, uh, he had that thesis. He asserted that, and he is dead. And there is an investigation en, en Unido, in the UK. Mm, hubo dos well, there were two that I knew about, sí. actually, or that I, eh, la primera era that existed, I believe. One, quién había to matado see a, who. Alexander had killed Alexander Litvinenko. Se, se en uh, two specific people were identified. And then there was a different proceeding about the reasons why these two people killed Mr. Litvinenko. Aquí, eh, el británico the una British judge de del ruso uh, de thought it was probable that the Russian state had participated in dicho, this killing. I've always said Said, uh, in the meeting that I had with Mr. Livanenko, I was very critical of him because I believed he was from the secret services and that uh, he had worked with Mr. Barivovsky, who was an oligarch, and so I thought that relationship was, uh, well, it could not exist if he was going to cooperate with Spanish justice, uh, but he did cooperate with us. Uh, uh, and I fully trust, although this is many years later, I fully trust Livinenko's words. He was an honorable man. I know he wanted to collaborate with us, and he did. I don't know any kind of other cooperation he might have had, but he also has a book, I believe, which defends the thesis that you have just asserted. Yo vuelvo a lo mismo. And yo no he en I have esa, not tanto, detected ni, ni that confirmo, this ni, ni thesis is true. Es que no, I don't want to no criticize it. I don't want to support it because mm, I... I'll, I'll go last on that one and give you what, what amounts to an official position. But uh, Ben 
became famous at the age of 23 with his book, Fragile Empire, about Russia. Do you want to touch this? You don't have to. Um, uh, 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 is this no, 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 it's not. Sorry about yeah, the Yeah, yeah, no, it's sort of, right. thank you. I'm, I'm not, you don't have to touch yeah, it's sort of, um, I've got a slightly different thesis when it comes to Russia. But, uh, something that I personally think is that there are actually limits to a kleptocracy paradigm in understanding the motivations of Russian politicians and that a certain point of view in thinking that the Russian elite's motivations can uniquely be explained in terms of maximizing profits and maximizing rents only goes so far and doesn't explain the full necessity they have to embark on sort of struggle and collision with, uh, with the West. And I think a kleptocracy framework is useful for un but I think I, I personally go for a more pared down version of it. In the early 2000s, there was very popular in academia, um, for obvious reasons, there was uh, an over-focus on trying to find ideologies behind the Putin regime. It took ideology, I think, much too seriously in trying to understand how the Kremlin thought. Now, there hasn't been in the, ma in the mainstream enough interrogation of these besieged fortress mentalities, what they mean, what the Russian um, establishment has uh, come to come to believe about uh, certain things and how it's propagating these ideologies and pumping them in to s institutions and sort of networks and institutions, you know, from the, the whole secret service world, and it really is a world of private schools and private hunting lodges and, uh, and into the bureaucracy and into the, the military. I think that when we talk about Russia, a comment that one receives from Russian uh, officials and their myriad, myriad, myriad uh, sock puppets is you're talking about fragments, you know, fragmentary remains of the 1990s. And they do have a point here, which is that the anal certainly the discussion in the media we get is an over-focus on a generation of ambitious 1990s oligarchs heavily criminalized, heavily in bed with the Kremlin, but who had these sort of Western global financial uh, ambitions. And there isn't enough discussion of these other generations of rentiers and kleptocrats, which either don't have ambitions on a global scale or know that they're not going to be possible for them to achieve, or of the generation of sort of Putin, uh, Putin oligarchs whose motivations have become a lot more blurred with a, sort of, with a restricted element of ideology, but it's still, uh, it's still uh, there. And just as a kind of bottom line, which is, is that a purely kleptocratic Russia, uh, Russian elite uh, would not have embarked on the policies that it has uh, over the last five or, six, uh, uh, five or six years. You need to think of Russia as a fusion of uh, kleptocracy and uh, ideology and uh, you know, what is a very real kind of uh, me bureaucratic and repressive mechanism, in my uh, opinion. Sebastian, do you want to comment or leave this one? Uh, or, or Just briefly, I mean, I would have to spend, I've spent many years covering powerful mafias where, the, where the, the lines between the mafia and the state blur around the world, particularly Latin America, countries like Mexico, countries like Argentina, countries like Guatemala, which are different people have talked about as models of penetration of the state by mafias, and, and, and Italy and, and other places. I, haven't, I don't think I've covered Russia long enough or in depth enough to, to assert a thesis like that, which a journalist probably shouldn't assert uh, anyway, unless he's written, you know, a very long article or, or a short book on it, or a long book. Uh, but certainly, m my work so far, through looking at this issue and comparing it to others, is I haven't seen in other places where I've covered very powerful, very dangerous mafias, this blurring that the Spanish cases show very well of organized crime, intelligence, and law enforcement services. The business world and politics. I mean, that, that, that the way those things all come together in, in the, the the model of Eurasian mafias is is remarkable and disturbing, as some of the specific cases like Litvinenko or, or others show. Well, I, I would like to ask a question actually to, to sort of uh, to our, our honoured guest, which is: Have any or have you, in any of your cases have you come across 
any individuals linked to Trump or linked to people linked to Trump? Oh, <laughs> just to shift gears radically. <laughs> no. no. All right. Let me let me continue to to uh, with this question. The official position of course, is that we don't have one. Uh, I mean, Hudson Institute is a think tank and it doesn't take uh, official positions of this sort. Uh, but I think the answer is we don't care. In other words, we don't care what you call it. What we're concerned with is US national security and uh, nothing is going to be 100%. I mean, this, this thesis of the Russian mafia state, obviously it's not, it's never completely true. Uh, but we do think that, obviously, and we work closely with Karen DeWisha, that it is an interesting explanatory paradigm in terms of understanding what's going on, and particularly in understanding the extent to which the St. Petersburg group has increasingly increased its power within the Russian state. Uh, that is, at this point, a factual descriptive, one might say. I don't think too many people including those involved, would question this a whole lot. I mean, they're, they're not spending a lot of time trying to debunk that. Um, so I think uh, it is now almost quarter of noon. I think we can uh, end on that. And thank you, Ambassador, very much for your question, which was a wonderful note uh, to end on. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.